Thank you everyone for joining me in another episode of hashtag real talk with Aaron Bragg. Uh, today's topic is um, the exploring the ramification, excuse me, exploring the ramifications on the solar winds supply chain attack. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to look at it from that small and medium business angle. Today's uh, guest is Greg Franceth. So that we were just talking about like boy, girl, boy naming. <laughs> uh, that's an easy way to do it. Like, right. I butcher last names, right? Like I, I make no bones about it. I, I have to apologize all the time, but Fran Seth, Fran Seth, Greg Fran right. Seth from, uh, from cadre is filling in for Ken. So Ken quickly, we want, we want to give you a special shout out. We hope that um, your dad uh, recovers well because as we all know, we're in the middle of something called a pandemic. I'm fortunate enough to be um, a healthcare worker. So even though I am not awesome, like the doctors and nurses in my healthcare system, I am considered a critical support person because security does kind of help. So I've been, I have both shots. So if you don't have your shots, get your shots. Okay. I'm going to be quiet. Turn it over to Greg. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got into the information security business. Well, sure thing. Uh, first of all, it's great to be with you, uh, Aaron. Um, so yes, I'm Greg Franceth with Cadre Information Security. I'm our, our uh, Director of uh, Professional Services here. I oversee uh, all of our, our engineers and, and analysts that uh, uh, work on security uh, products, software issues, resolving issues, etc., as well as training. So uh, all of those different units, we get to work with a, a wide variety of, of customers, uh, and their various experiences. Uh, myself, I, I came up, you know, back in the 90s, where if you could do anything with this new thing called the internet, they would throw money at you. So I dropped <laughs> my degree in history and got into computers. <laughs> um, so it is interesting to see everybody's different backgrounds, right? Because a right. lot of people are trying to break into industry. And so many times we have to tell them like, hey, you might have to take a non- traditional approach to breaking in the career. So right. history, right. excellent. <laughs> so anyway, so after, you know, years of doing that, uh, you know, if you're in IT, eventually it's about, uh, you know, security and uh, it found my way to Cadre a few years back. Uh, you know, great environment here. My um, things are a little loose because I'm trying to fill some pretty big shoes for Ken today. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, um, what else can I tell you? Oh. That's, that's, that's a good, that we, we have a lot to cover, so we're going to jump right in. So for everyone listening in, we're going to kind of break it up between um, three, three different segments. We're going to just talk briefly at a high level to kind of set the stage, get everybody on the same page. I know that listeners probably will have varying degrees of how much they know, right? But remember, we're going to put this through the lens of a small and medium business, so let's just recap and then the middle part, we're going to talk about the news that was released yesterday about how, you know, there's, there's the Chinese angle, right? Which literally yep. should surprise no one, but we're going to talk about what they did. And then we're going to finish it off with that third segment. We're going to talk about like, you know, maybe some specific controls, you know, why security hygiene is so important. Some of this stuff is going to, you know, seem like I'm repeating myself, but I think kind of like the theme that we're going to do, you know, my podcast, I, I'm going to follow my mentor's advice and like, you know, we're going to make 2021 really about back to the basics. So let's cover that stuff. So first of all, um, Ken did a great uh, blog and I'll put a link onto the YouTube channel and the Buzzsprout podcast site to it where he got into a little bit of details. So let's talk about that. Like quickly from a high level, you know, what is, what is solar, solar winds? Like, mm -hmm. you know, how did something so big and then, you know, how did something so big happen? Sure, right. So for uh, for those who aren't familiar, I mean, Solar Winds has been around a long time. The the product in question was uh, their Orion platform, which is sort of a um, IT management suite for you know network uh, traffic monitoring, configuration, uh, virtualization, server management, um, you know, resource monitoring. So IT organizations of all kinds, uh, you know. Uh, use that product and it's sold in a sort of a la carte set. So you have maybe not real small businesses, but lots of medium and larger businesses have uh, some share of this uh, Orion product. 
uh, out there. Uh, it's a very popular uh, product. Um, and what's really critical in this case is that this is a control system of the IT department, right? This, these are the people we trust, and this mm -hmm. is their software. Um, so what happened is a, an entity um, believed to be uh, an, an agency of a state actor, most likely uh, Russia, broke into their systems and inserted code into a patch update for this Orion software. Um, so when the update was delivered to customers, uh, it included this code, essentially a classic Trojan, just it's very unusual. This is what we call a supply chain attack for it to come in that way. Usually we get Trojans that are coming in as attachments on emails, embedding mm -hmm. yourself in the system. This was coming in through a trusted source. So if I'm a user, I'm just, as far as I'm concerned, I'm doing the right thing. I'm just patching my software. Right. Unfortunately, that patch included this nefarious code, which gave access, uh, uh, to, which had the access system to call back to an outside location and then initiate a variety of, of uh, things. And we can get into some of the specifics of that. But the bottom line is uh, SolarWinds believes that there were 18,000 customers who had the software in question. Now, whether they all implemented the patch is right. probably not true. As you know, right. patch management is all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I, I may or may not fight with uh, our infrastructure team all the time on, <laughs> on uh, proper management patch management, which we've done a better job, but I mean, even, even a mature um, IT system like we have, you bring up some good points. And, you know, before we go to, to the next part of that, let's, let's talk about that for a minute, because if you were, you know, we, we tend to, you know, we're in Michigan. So we use the auto mm -hmm. supplier NASD, right? Because it's, it's near and dear to us right. or furniture. If you're moving quickly, right, and you you're listening to you know VARs or trusted advisors, you know like Cadre, to have different types of software in your system to make you more secure and make you more efficient, you're having to rely on you know the quality of that work, right? Because Absolutely. it's not, um, uh, you know, I'll go down the road. You know, I have friends that work at Dematic, right? Like it's not Dematic's job to look sort through every single piece of code for the vendor software that they're getting right there has to be that level of trust so this is something to where i'm not surprised so many people were blindsided and affect so many people because you know this is a new area of attack right right you know, we for for the tr longest time we've thought front door phishing you know don't click on this don't click on this mm -hmm. now you have a new series of attacks right like thinking about how you implement back doors even though the government's been saying for a while hey you know pay attention to your supply chain right you know <clears throat> them getting to the keys to the kingdom <laughs> is a little unheard of so you know you can't really there's, you know, I'm sure some people want to blame, but let, you know, let's talk about that a little bit more. So you're saying, if I'm understanding correctly, you're saying this was a nation state. And this is important, I think, for small and medium business to understand because, you know, these aren't script kiddies. These aren't, you know, hacktivists. These aren't everything else. Nation right. states are, they're, they are businesses in their own right, right? right. They, have, uh, they have access to a bunch of different funds in different times. So, you know, as that supply chain, you know, what am, what am I going to do? You know, what are other things that we could have done to avoid this? We'll talk about that later, mm -hmm. but how, how widespread you say 18,000, right? What are the names? Are there names of big players? You know, was the government affected? You sure. Know, how, how, how bad was it? Yeah. So the, the answer to that last question we can start with, and that's, we don't know. Um, this, the, this exploit was first being delivered nine months ago. Um, so, you know, the, the, these actors were um, in these environments for months and months and months before they were detected. And it's going to take a very long time. Um, let me actually take a sidebar. This gets them in the network. There's lots of other exploits that they take advantage of then to embed themselves in other parts of the network. So this is just the open door, but we don't know what other doors they unlocked in the process. Right. And so 
at this point, all the affected entities, whether it's government agency, private company, or whatnot, is got to be going through the process of figuring out what other doors need to be closed and locked, as it were. Now, as to the specific individual or individual entities affected, um, it does appear that the primary targets uh, were U.S. federal government agencies and uh, large. Gary. Uh, yes, <laughs> but yes. but not surprising. I am not, not surprising. surprised at all. That's the valuable assets are there. I mean, you want to be scary. One of the government agencies is the agency that oversees the security of our nuclear materials. Had this oh, Orion nice. software. Oh, um, nice. So, um, but 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 the other interesting thing is that the other targets appear to be large IT providers, uh, so security and non-security. So it, it also tells you something about where the value is. It's the, the government part is very scary, but when you start saying that companies like Microsoft and uh, FireEye and you know uh, other um, you know, VMware, although that we now think that was a separate hack, Cisco. These companies were also targeted. Now, we should be clear, there's a difference between targeted and actively breached and exploited. Right. right. Um, and, and even when we get to breached and exploited, there are varying degrees there. Uh, but we do know because of the length of time this is going on that uh, there's a lot of concerns about uh, the information that may have been exfiltrated from uh, these uh, agencies and companies. And in some cases, just the email that was monitored. Uh, email monitoring appears to be one of the things that these actors were going after. Because uh, this was, if you think about it, this was an intelligence operation. You know, there's oh. lots of cyber crime out there that's a business. You know, we're gonna, mm -hmm. we're gonna blackmail you, we're gonna steal your money, it's the mob. This is, you know, a, a state agency looking for valuable information to serve their state interests. Mm -hmm. So, so two Two th two initial thoughts on that, and we're still doing pretty good on time because I want to I want to make sure we give enough time for the other sections. One eighteen thousand, mm -hmm. so even a nation state actor, right? So let's 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 look at you know we'll look at Iran, right? So mm -hmm. Iran, you know, some people think, oh, poor country, you know, how, you know, who cares, right? Well, what mm -hmm. they're not understanding is, you know, major parts of their budget are fund, you know go to funding things like, you know, like their, you know, their hacking groups and stuff like that. Right. So my guess is probably out of that 18,000, I don't think that 18,000, they didn't, they wouldn't have time. Like, man, yeah. even a Russia, let's, yeah. let's think about it. Nine months, 18,000, you still have, um, it's, it's a resource issue, right. right? Like manpower, whether you're a bad guy or a good guy, you right. have a limited amount of time, limited amount, limited amount of resources. Bad guys may have unlimited time, but they still have unlimited resources. So I probably think it's a fair bet that not all 18,000 are literally SOL, right? That's correct. And, and But so, it's important to understand that for, for uh, nefarious actors, whether they're state agency or, or criminal, it uh, doesn't really matter. It's a, still a cost-benefit analysis. Now, the benefit is the value of what you can get, but you can also get something by having really low cost. So typically your targets fall into those two buckets. Do you have something really valuable or are you really easy to exploit? And that's where a lot of uh, smaller companies, small, medium businesses get themselves into trouble is they think I'm not General Motors, I'm not Microsoft. What do I have that anyone cares about? But if you've done so very little that your environment is easy to exploit, they can, the resource commitment is, hey, we'll take one of our junior guys, give him you know, preset tools that they just, you know, utilize and either extract information to be used later or they dump you into a ransomware situation. There's lots of ways. So it's always important we're paying attention to both sides of that because you're absolutely correct. They're not going to go after 18,000. They're going to look at that and say, who's got the high benefits? Who's got the low costs? Those are my rich targets. But it's still, we, we sh probably shouldn't lose sight on the fact that we still need those small auto manufact automotive manufacturers to understand that they need to look at their product a little bit differently. Like it's, you know, they're in it to make money, right? Yep. Dematic, dematic for, you know, they got great people, great products, uh, but they're still in to make money, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think they need to look at, understand that 
they need to look at things a little more holistically because they may have like, they may manufacture, you know, I don't know what it is, but let's just paraphrase and say 15 components. What if one of those components um, is key for like the braking system right. or something like that, right? Like, you know, the whole Stuxnet stuff where, you know, the US, mm -hmm. well, alleged, <laughs> I don't want to get yelled at. I have a good relationship with my government. I want to keep it that way. <laughs> um, alleged, the US, US or Israel allegedly, <laughs> you know, created that piece of malware, shot it over to Iran, and then it wreaked havoc. Now, that worked, right? So why, mm -hmm. and you know, the, the, I like to use football analogies from time to time, but you know, the, the rule in football is, is you run the same play until the other team stops you. Right. Right. So why not take that strategy and, you know, go for, or, you know, five deep in a supply chain, yep. and, you know, and embed that code or figure out some sort of defect in that breaking mechanism for the long game. And this is where I really feel bad for small and medium businesses because they have to think differently when it comes to security, but they don't have the resources right. to be able to go up against a nation state actor. So that's, right. that's something we'll, we'll, that's a podcast topic, a different yeah, way absolutely. where I really think that the government needs to step yeah. in and figure but, out. But there is a simple protect. point there around the idea that, you know, it's it's easy to be overwhelmed about how scary these things are, but and I'm sure we'll talk about some of this when it comes to that small medium business. At the same time, there are steps you can take that you don't have to solve the entire problem. You just need to solve it for where you are, and that is actually management. Good security hygiene. Back to the basics. <laughs> we'll get that one a little bit. Um, the other the other thing before we move to the next segment that I'm wondering about is is maybe all of it wasn't exfiltration, right? Like right. sometimes I try and think of an alternate alternate universe, right? Like I, you know, I'm, a, I'm an old school comic book fan. There's an evil me <laughs> some, in, somewhere in a multiverse. You know, what would I do if I had that kind of access, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I would, again, run that same game plan. So... I, you know, they talked about how Microsoft, certain parts of the Microsoft source code was looked at. I think right. Microsoft did a good job. They like poked around. They didn't see, as far as they know, didn't right. see any major changes. I'm really, I'm, you know, Microsoft spends bazillions of dollars on security and has a bunch of people. I, you know, for the most part, I have to have faith that they're doing the right thing when it comes yep. to secure software development life, life cycle. That being said, I still would try and figure out other ways to embed, right? Because- yes. Yes. You had nine, you had nine months. Right. And while as a former developer, nine months isn't a <laughs> lot of time, but if you're running the same game plan, you know, and you're trying to do the same development and might just be in different, you know, software environments, right. that's still a lot of time. It like, is. I think if I was, you know, if I was any, any kind of, you know, smaller medium business, I would have to assume that like, okay, it, you know, it's bad and go right. backwards from there. Right. right. Like, fi Absolutely. like figure out a game plan. And we'll talk about that in the third segment, figure out a game plan to figure out like, how bad was it? Is right. that, is that what's being recommended or I mean, yeah. So sounding so fuddy. I should start with, um, <laughs> As I read this story, I thought about, you know, anytime you call the doctors to make an appointment, the recording always begins with something like, if this is an actual emergency, please hang <laughs> yeah, up and call 911. I want to say, if this is new to you and you are a user of one of these products, please hang up and call your cybersecurity partner. <laughs> so, um, yes, you know, it, it is it is important that, that we respond to that. And I, I think that, you know, I had a, a, a good friend of mine um, who, of all things, had an entire business making a specific washer actually for the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. He had a technique to make it. Um, he made it at a price that there was no reason for the automotive companies to go elsewhere. He had a fine little business doing just this washer. Um, but here's the thing. If anyone stole his technique, his company was worthless. And so one of the things we have to be careful oh, of is you allude to is the value here is, you know, when we talk about exfiltration, isn't necessarily that they're getting a, a really super tangible thing. Sometimes it might be just 
and, the, and this will be true of the government too, what are the processes going beyond, on beyond the scenes? Who talks to who? Who are the really important people? At a, at a business, it might be, okay, we know who the CEO is, but which are the engineers that are the geniuses behind this? That's a really super valuable piece of information. So it, it, we often lose track of, we get so focused on dollars and documents that we lose track of the value of some of our more intangible assets. And so I think that's something to be thinking of as far as sort of the broader scope and sort of what I was alluding to earlier, you know, CISA is recommending that, listen, if you have the, uh, you know, Orion uh, platform that had this update, you need to rebuild from scratch. Don't try and fix it. Um, and in fact, you then need to look at anything else that might've been touched, rebuild those from scratch. Because, and especially for small and medium businesses, one of the challenges here the is- cost. The, it's just going to be the cost. That's right. Exactly. How are you? Oh God, this is frustrating. I don't, <laughs> I don't, can you tell I don't like bad guys? <laughs> yeah. Uh, who, yeah. Um, That's why they're, this makes them bad you guys. You have to respect them, right? Because I mean, they literally- Sure could make my life hell you got to respect it but you don't right. have to like respect and like are two different things right. um well that's a good that's a good segue right so yeah. i'm gonna i'm gonna share screen real quick because i think people need to look at this article a little bit differently so we're gonna give a shout out to reuters so yesterday um they talked you know they had an exclusive. Of course, everybody's exclusive, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, suspect, suspected Chinese hackers use SolarWinds bug to spy on U.S. payroll agency. So let's talk about that for a minute. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they talk about they, you know, used flaws in the software, and which is which is funny because, you know, like James Azar, Azar and some of the, you know, my other peers in the security kind of industry, were trying to get people to understand, like, you know, everybody's, you know, Russia may have done this, but right. You know, if you think that China or others aren't going to jump on or coordinate or have any kind of convert, anything to do with this, th right. then you're full of beans. And, and lo and behold, obviously, once you dig in more as an analyst, you're finding stuff like this. Absolutely. So you talked about non, non like monetary fallout from mm -hmm. this, like the intelligence in scattering, right? Like some people might say, well, why would the Chinese need to, you know, hack into U.S. payroll, right? Are they going to mess with people's paycheck or they, they try and steal money? I would argue that I think you're on the right track with, with, with no, right? It comes to an intelligent thing because one of the Chinese that they've done so much in the last few years, well, you know, I hate to say it, but let's call it spade a spade is identify weaknesses right it's almost like that it feels like a cold war remember how like you had the oh, movies yeah. where like the russian agents you know or would you know try and find like the different american guys that you know didn't have girlfriends or you know right. blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah. you know that stuff was based on real stuff i remember like i'm gonna go on this is my first mini tangent sorry but it'll be relevant <laughs> i promise um my dad my father uh, used to work for the U.S. Embassy in Russia. And I remember one of the things that he talked about was, is they tried to, you know, the contractors would try and find, you know, husband and wife combos. My mom would end up going over there. But for that purpose, right? Like there are mm -hmm. different places that you couldn't go because you would be an easy target. And some right. people were like, I, you know, I'm blah, blah, blah. I can smell out like, you know, a, a lady trying to woo me for, you know, <laughs> no, you're, you're guys and we can be them. Yeah. But yeah, intelligence, The internet right? has proven that, that we are all wrong about that. Anybody who thinks they, they know themselves, the internet has already proven you wrong. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I'm going to, sorry, I was diverging. So I'm going to get back on it. But the whole point is that classic Intel, right? Yes. Like now they have access to find out who works where, right? Because for the most part, you know, my LinkedIn profile is public, right? Like for better, for worse, my defensive attack is I put as much as I can out there. So if somebody sees like an Aaron Bragg or my cousin that lives in Canada, mm -hmm. um, who's also, you know, pretty well known, if they see something crazy, then they know, hey, most likely it's not, you know, Aaron goes on tangents, but it's, it's not related to this. <laughs> not everybody in the government puts their information, like, you right. know, their, their, their information out there for obviously nefarious reasons, because, you know, spear phishing, I look at yep. this and I think, whoa, 
Now I need to start doing specialized targets. And again, those nation state actors are going to be able to look at these different agencies Mm -hmm. and people need to understand, speaking of small and medium businesses, not every part of the federal government is huge, right? You and I talked about that a little bit before the podcast. Like there are some government agencies that have, you know, five, 10, maybe only, you know, 25 people just because they're smaller doesn't mean they're not important. So, you know, I'd be interesting to see, how and, many and people the was in the dis- payroll agencies? They get the federal discounts on buying, but that doesn't increase their budget enough to buy everything they need. <laughs> right. Um, right. You know, you're absolutely right about that. And, and just, you know, again, just sort of abstract this a little bit and just think about information. Think about your, whoever you are, your pay stub and information that's on there. That well, what if somebody is having extra taxes withheld? Oh, that's interesting. Do they owe back taxes? You know, what what else might be going on there? Um, is there a discrepancy between their claim dependence and what we find on social media? I mean, you know, it, it, for that matter, is their official name different? I mean, there's point. like very like simple the, things the, that the mistress, the extra child that you're paying that you're <laughs> you're paying for, <laughs> it makes you a blackmail target. So, yep. um, yeah, and, and I mean, we can sort of spin this into the to, to the James Bond world, but it, the thing about information is I don't necessarily know how I'm going to use it yet for it to have value. Right. Just getting information can be a value in and of itself. It helps me paint a picture of what's going on in different places. But the other thing, and this is super critical, and we sort of touched on this earlier with, when it comes to small and medium businesses, um, they're often a gateway to higher value targets. Uh, so I, if, I, if I have a really hard time breaking into um, you know, big federal Microsoft, agency, Microsoft. Us, let's right. use so, those solar winds use case. Yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. Solar so, winds. You know, well, you know, a major player in that market, you know, and maybe even a global player, so to speak, is still not a behemoth company, right? Like a Microsoft, right? And so, what we saw in the case of Microsoft is um, there was over the course of last year. Um, hacks into the Office 365 environment that only were exploitable by people being represented by a third-party reseller. Interesting. So, you know, Microsoft is, was really trying to tell everybody, you're okay, we know the very particular vector, but what was interesting is they had opened things up to the to their partners, and that was where, where their in particular exploit occurred. And I will say, mm-hmm. Kudos to Microsoft because they have done a great job of being transparent. Um, one and of the Fire things- as well, right? Absolutely. Like I remember, I remember at the beginning, some people on LinkedIn kind of like bashing them. And I wanted to be like, really? You're going to, yeah. you're going to, th- <laughs> you're in the security industry. You're going to throw a stone in a, gla- <laughs> right, <laughs> in a glass right, house. Right. You <laughs> of all, you people all know that there's no such thing as hundred percent security. Right. Um, you know, the positive side of that, right, is yep. they shared a ton of right. information. And I yep. think they should get they should get some kudos for that, right? And and they've actually done all of us massive favors in the case of FireEye because they know that they had red team tools exfiltrated. And for those who don't know, their red team is their internal people who act like uh, bad guys. Bad guys, right? Yep. So it's the tools that they use. Um, those are now floating out there. We have no idea who has access to that. They say nothing. Everybody at this point. <laughs> well, right, exactly. All the bad guys most likely do. <laughs> like, they say got, nothing. Let's call a spade a spade again. <laughs> All the bad guys have those tools. You right. Know, we're, we're, we're saying it in a joking manner, but right. in all serious no, it, they all have them. You right, have and, to, and if, if have to go but if FireEye, FireEye could have taken the position, we know what they have. We have a competitive advantage now, even though it was on some level came from us. But by it, disclosing some information about what those tools were within, within the security industry, uh, they've actually raised the level of security. And I think it's something the industry over the last t- five to 10 years has really gotten a hold of understanding that there is a we're all in this together. Um, we still have work to do in creating international framework around that, but that's Open a podcast source security another day. APIs. I know, I know yep. I talk about that all the time. And- yep. The kilted one, Chris Roberts has been yelling at security vendors to start collaborating on that too. Yep. So, 
Anyway, I'm not sure how we got there, but yeah, we we did, we went on a tangent. Mike was or Lori was supposed to say, "Come bring it back." Okay, no, but I mean, I I do want to I want I want to save about you know 10, 15 minutes to talk about like okay, what can we do? All this happened. We talked at a high level about what happened. <clears throat> we talked about how bad guys are going to pivot in ways that you you've never you know you haven't thought of before. When I say you, a small and medium business, I know major pl players in the security industry right. know they're going to pivot this way. But I mean, for that, for that dramatic and, you know, other small, you know, medium businesses. So let's talk about things that they, you can do, you know, the cleanup, right? Cause every right. fallout has that cleanup phase and being mindful that, you know, small and medium businesses don't have quite the same budget. Right. What are some things they can do without breaking the bank mm -hmm. to maybe just do a sniff test on to see if they, you know, right. were they affected? You know, what what can they do? Let's talk about security hygiene for a minute. So let let me start by just sort of putting a little bit of a a, 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 a framework around this because I think we need to make sure we're understanding things. And this, I'm mean, using the analogy of a car. You could also use the human body. But if you think about what keeps you safe in your car, you know, traditionally it was that the car, the the metal that's around you, right? You know, um, and to this day, that's the number one. Thing that's going to keep you safe. But over the years, we've added things inside the car. You know, so some of those are physical protections like airbags, and others of them are, um, uh, are about how we interact with the car, the intelligence of the car, the information we now get. I know, hey, my tire is low on air. So I, it, you know, I, I, in the past, I wouldn't know my car wouldn't be as responsive as I expected when I swerved and I'd end up in a crash. Now I know to make sure I keep my, you know, so, so our companies are no different. We, we still have that, we wanna keep the bad guys out, but we've got to be have a system inside the company uh, like an immune system that's always looking to say is something not right here. And so the first thing I say is, if you are relying solely on you know, a firewall and email security, um, then it's worth having a big picture uh, look at, at uh, how you're, you're dealing with security because a lot of the companies that were affected will still have been able to identify that there was activity going on inside their company that was not okay. Mm -hmm. So things were happening on computers that were showing up in logs, ideally if they have some sort of a SIM solution or if they have a managed service partner you know, that someone is able to look at. Mm -hmm. So there's an extent to which we always have to assume that someone can get in and what are we doing at that point um in in the case of 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 things like this there's a few things that we see very clearly that um were exploited after the bad guys got in and a lot of that has to do with credentials permissions certificates uh those sorts of things so we want to make sure that you know we have really good solutions in this space so Passwords, absolutely. I know this is you know basic hygiene, right? But no, you know, but we're getting to back to the basics. And, your passwords right. have to be protected. Um, that you know means not just having really difficult things. Remember, you know, using password vaults of some sort. You know, if you're using um, uh, uh, MFA hard, key, like yeah. I, I was yeah. fortunate enough to to do a podcast with Yubi Keys, and seeing the cost on mm -hmm. those. And and really, how cheap they are? Yeah, I, I'm, we're gonna a mini tangent. Sorry, Larry. <laughs> Why don't more companies do MFA? Right? Because you're talking about, you know, and and Ken's notes here. Ken, we're gonna talk about mm -hmm. this. Like, implement MFA to internal infrastructure and controls. Yep. Right. So, so you know, I in the pre podcast, him and I talked a little bit about like you can't trust your internal network anymore. That's right. Right. Like, That's right. You got you know. Every, you know, everybody talks about defense and depth and everything else, but it's almost like you have to look at your network and understand that you can't trust anything anymore. Right? right. And I mean, not, I'm not in the zero trust sense, like from a marketing mm -hmm. point of view is like, right. Hey, are there different areas that internally that I can start putting MFA, you know, MFA right. on? which is, which is new, right? Like that's, that's a little bit different. I have DevOps engineers yep. that argue and be like, oh, well, why, you know, why do I want to do this? Why do I want to use 
you know, a PAM privileged assets manager yeah. to check out those credentials, but you're bringing up a good point. We got to start, you know, and Ken too, we got to start thinking that our network isn't as secure. You know, we still have that firewall. We still have lots of protection sure. but after right. they get in, you know, how can we segment stuff off? Well, how and can you we do MFA. You alluded to a really important piece of that when you mentioned PAM, Privilege Access Management, because, you know, one of the key pieces of that, a lot of people hear that and they think, oh, I just need to make sure that, you know, everything has, you know, some sort Strong of password, who, who can have permissions is, and who can't. But, but that's password of, hygiene. That's right. not password management. And, and one of the things that, that if you're doing a PAM implementation, you're looking at is, do I know what I have? Do I know who my people are? And do I know the mapping between those? Who should have access to what? And a lot of companies fall down because they don't really, you know, the marketing people have done their thing and the sales people have done their thing and the accounting people have done their thing and IT is just supposed to keep it all running. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, but but one of the jobs that, that IT has to champion across the company, because it's a company-wide thing, is making sure you have an understanding of what those IT assets are and who or what should have access to them. I thought we explained what X, oh, Mike's calling me out of my own role, which acronym... I'm all oh, MFA. Oh, well, multi-factor authentication. When Pam, we did, we said privilege access management. Okay. Yeah. All right. so, so yeah, just so to distinguish, multi-factor authentication is just when I log in that I'm being asked for another means, either me, a person, or a system to identify itself. Most of us experience that as we get a code text to us on our cell phone that we then type into a web page. So that um, this way, if someone gets access to my computer, but they don't have my cell phone, they still won't be able to get in. Mm -hmm. uh, it's often talked about a combination of something you have and something you know, so they're discrete things. So, you know, I, I, I have to have my cell phone and I have to know that this is where I met my wife or something or other. Mm -hmm. So that's where multi-factor gets beyond it. it. It dodges the whole question of what if someone gets my password? No worries, MFA has you covered. Then privilege, privilege access management, now we're talking about really, okay, I know who you are, but you're still not allowed to touch this. This is, you, you do not, you know, you should not be using this system. Um, and having that in a controlled, in a systematic way. Um, and, but again, the underlying piece of that is doing the work to and answer those questions. As with a lot of tools, the tool can only do so much. Um, do you... Along those lines, because I haven't, you know, I've been a little busy with my day job, so I haven't <laughs> had the chance to to get dig in deeper to a lot of stuff. For the code that was injected, did they have? Did they ever found out what Solar Winds secure development lifecycle? Do they? Was it? I'm assuming if they got in and did what they did, that it was pretty lax. But I mean, has investigations shown yeah. that so, they weren't do, really winds. doing secure software development? Solar Winds, unfortunately, does not have the best track record record over a number of years. Um, one of the challenges, everybody in security of all kinds, and most of my IT colleagues out there are going to roll their eyes when I, I say this, but unfortunately, too often uh, we judge people by how many bad things happened. And the reality is some people just get lucky. Mm -hmm. and. But, but they get judged as, oh, yeah, they're fine. They've never had a major breach. Um, many people have not had a major breach because they do all the right things and they, they keep it safe. There's somebody, always luck involved. Somebody just got lucky. Always and terrible. luck involved. Solar Winds does not have the best track record um, when it came to, to a number of things. Um, right now, it's, you know, they're, they're trying to say how they're addressing their whole process. Um, but again, it's funny you mentioned Sol Rins is not a behemoth, but they're also not tiny. They have contractors, they have um, companies that provide things to them. And apparently there were some issues in, in their controls along that space as well. Wow, um, that doesn't surprise me. Marketing was putting, putting pressure on the development team to get stuff to market yep. without doing secure coding. I have... Mike, I've never heard of that before. You've never heard me talk about that, have you? <laughs> or, or the infamous, we'll get it in the next version. <laughs> yeah, that's a, a secure, security after the fact. Or one of my colleagues talks about that time, like, secure you by 
security by obscurity is that's it yeah it's 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 not security no <laughs> no um all right so we're, we are starting to run up against it so what are so those are you know again back to the basics right right but if you're a small and medium business and maybe you only have like one or two developers or you rely on right. you know contractors to help supplement your development team what are some what are some, what are some advice to them? Do, is it time that even even companies, you know, like Dematic and Steelcase and you know Herman mm -hmm. Miller and all my lovely companies in my hometown, do they have to start looking at the fourth party, you know, fourth party risk and those when it comes to software development, and say, hey, what are your practices, right? Yeah. Because if I'm going to use software that you develop, are you do you think we're going to start seeing contracts change because i i put this question to um last week i interviewed um a cyber policies lawyer mm -hmm. um allison from beckage and that's going to be a really good one because i really she opened my eyes she's like yeah. change is coming with contracts and she said she's already starting to see solar winds fallout with right. how some contracts are being changed have you are you guys seeing that at cadre yeah, and I think I, I'm really excited to 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 hear that podcast because you know I think and again we're sort of talking about small and medium business we sort of always relied on we hope the big big guys are leaning on all these people and then we benefit, um, but you know it's 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 a diverse competitive environment out there you know and it's it's you know there's always the tension of um, you know do I you know, if I work with, I can work exclusively with Microsoft and Cisco and these massive companies and, and hope for that. Um, although that's not a guarantee. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, Their or, source code was just looked at. So right, that's exactly. not a guarantee. <laughs> or, or do I, you know, just go with, you know, each solution independently and that way, you know, any breach is limited to the smallest space possible. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the reality is, and again, we alluded to some of this earlier, I, I think there, there probably is a sea change coming that says, and this is not just industry, this is not just the U.S., that we need to have more of a framework around this because it, it affects everybody. It, you know, when you're talking about supply chains being involved, well, those supply chains do not sit in Michigan or Ohio, right? right? Yep. They are global. You're important. You're important. You're important stuff from China. Yep. Um, you know, the A Asian PAC comp uh, countries. I mean, think about how much like you have like the, you know, the Philippines and even Vietnam starting to, you know, produce more things. So, you know, a lot of people, and this, this is going to sound political and it's mm -hmm. not, I promise I'm not trying to be political, but I need people to hear me out on this one. Globalization, you can't, you can't turn it off. Like right. we're never going back to the old days. You can still have America first. You can still build sure. as much as you can, right. but until the American consumer consumer changes its mind, Right. you're always going to have to rely on, you know, some cheaper parts and everything else. So you do, like you said, start having to think a little bit differently with your supply chain stuff. Right. So this is where I get a little bit frustrated and my libertarian friends are going to like just <laughs> explode right now. You need more government regulation. I'm sorry. It's right. one of the few areas, right? Like we need more regulation because my fear, and even when I talk to Allison, the solar winds fall out, you're going to have, you're going to have progressive states. And when I say progressive security, progressive, mm -hmm. not yeah. liberal progressive, sure. um, you know, privacy and security and everything else, your California's and your New York's mm -hmm. I'm really going hard at it. Yep. And it feels like you're doing, you know, states like Michigan and others who, you know, who I love, but we're not exactly on the bleeding edge of privacy right. <laughs> and, you know, in security. So it makes me feel like the government does need to come in and say, Hey, if you're in certain types of industries, you need to do certain things because they do it with medical insurance, right? Like HIP, right. there are HIPAA laws. Everybody has to deal with it. Everybody. Well, and they, they can be, they can be legal frameworks. They can be regulatory frameworks, but they can also be industry frameworks. Um, you know, I think all of these solutions, you know, are, are, are currently evolving because, you know, to the point, the bad guys, guess what? They're fully globalized too. You know, <laughs> they they yeah. don't sit and go, gosh, we develop our own code. No, the, the Russians <laughs> buy stuff care. from the Israelis who buy stuff from the Romanians. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's a global business just as, as well. Yeah. Um, 
but but I, you know sort of which if I ethics really we could do a whole podcast on ethics right oh like, right yeah absolutely you know but, but, some but some of the sales coming out of israel like, but like wait a minute i thought you guys were like good people yeah <laughs> So. But, but but I do want to say, you know, I do think there's an element when we look at the business of that, you know, I know we zero the zero trust cliche, you know, is out there, but there is an extent to which, you know, healthy skepticism is really important. And, and you can Absolutely. lean into your security partners on this. Mm-hmm. You know, what companies are doing now um, with, you know, just, just user and, and behavioral analytics and artificial intelligence. Uh, so, you know, and this will be on any of your next gen firewalls, you'll see it on your endpoint security. Um, but rather than saying we got to find every potential error in every code, piece of code from every person we bought software from, instead we can say, have software that looks at what happens on our network and raises a flag anytime something not normal is going on. You know, the cliche is something cheap like, you know, well, Jane never logs in from Dubai at 2 a.m. <laughs> and, and that's true. Yeah. We can detect Mark, that. Marketing people love to use that one. Yeah, I know. Marry, plug your ears. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but the truth is this software is way more sophisticated than that. And, you know, it can be looking at lots of different things. Why are these two machines exchanging information? You know, uh, they've never exchanged information before. Or why? was that when that exchange happens is now they're an exchange going out to the internet or why, you know, and it can get layer upon layer. And because there's intelligence built into this, it's learning about your network. And that's only going to get better and better and better. Um, and, and hey, I'll, I'll t- so here we'll, we'll, we'll say something for uh, our, our friends in the, in the free market space. The free market is what's making this work really well because there's a lot of really powerful companies competing for your dollars and they're going to get them by being really good at this. Yep. So you know, no, end user and we got an, we got another acronym and Lori's cash in the fishing line bring us back in because it is <laughs> almost time. Um, end user behavior analytics or some people use UEBA. What's so yeah, UEBA is user and entity behavior user and analysis. User entity, because we got to complicate things in marketing. I still like end user <laughs> behavior analytics because we're all end users. Yeah. Um. All right. So bringing it back, uh, we covered some some good things. I I am, I I, I think we went quickly through a lot of this, but I mean this touches a lot of stuff. I mean, uh, absolutely thousand potential victims right like right. you know just let that let that sink in and stew a little bit and really if anyone really uh you know is up at night with nothing to do sit down with the internet because it's it's actually the forensics of this is only getting more and more fascinating um you know the the because it's we tend to want to think of it as there was this incident but the truth is every incident is tied to other breaches and vulnerabilities mm-hmm. and when you get these powerful actors they're putting them together like a jigsaw puzzle uh, and that's why, you know, the, the you know, the, the cybersecurity experts, it's just impossible to turn to your average network guy or server guy and say, oh, also do this on your own. Right. Right. So, we do got to, we got to mature it. That's the other thing I'm, that's, I'm yeah, trying to, to pitch to the security vendors is we really do got to mature um, AI and machine learning and not just in a cheesy you know, it can do level one stuff. I talk about this all the time. We need it to start doing more advanced thinking. So, yeah. well, we are we are at limit for those of you listening in. I'm sorry, I, we, we went on a couple tangents today, but the, you know, this is important. I mean, we really need, people need to understand, you know, that concept of, you know, like Ken talked about is like yeah. your internal network isn't safe anymore. You know, what what can we do? How can we think differently? when it comes to that. So Greg, I appreciate the conversation very much. I, I'm sure Ken still bummed that he's not able to join, but once again, Ken, we, we, we send nothing but positive, positive thoughts and, and, and good hopes to your, your family as they uh, deal with some illness. Uh, As always, Lori, thanks for saying, thanks for lining this up. And Mr. Peterson, our, our trainee on the CSA board, who keeps tossing us good topics, uh, m- much appreciated. And hopefully, I think next month, we are going to try and reschedule that one in-person, in-person session. So hey, and I'll thank just you, Greg. Throw, I'll throw it out there and appreciate you, appreciate the platform, what you do. 
you, you, you mentioned you have a day job and uh, the other things that you do is just, you know, you, you mentioned today you were able to donate $500 to, to help children yeah, at, yep. at risk, we, students C at risk. Cedar Springs. So yep. Yep. That's, so. you know, nothing but good things coming your way. And we appreciate uh, you allowing Cadre to be a part of that because um, we, we take that uh, job seriously. We love helping communities. So uh, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Great topic. Great information. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Have yourself a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Has anybody known